as a substitute teacher, when are we allowed to be mad? And what are we allowed to do about it? Let's talk about it today, episode 36. All right, guys and gals, hope you had a good week. I had a great week. It started off for with President's Day, I'm sure, for most of you. So most of us probably had a four-day week. I kind of like the way my week went. I was at four different schools. I had one high school day. I had three middle school days. And there's nothing quite like seeing the dramatic cultural difference between Teaching sixth grade and teaching juniors and seniors. You know, it's kind of funny, even sixth grade to eighth grade, the sixth grade kids are just so impressionable and and so cute and so lovable. The difference I have noticed even two grades later with eighth grade is usually when you've got eighth grade students and you try to get them to be quiet and then you finally say, all right, guys, we got to go to zero until you all can obtain, you know, earn the right to talk again. They usually do it. With sixth graders, it's a little bit harder to get them to be settled down, but I really enjoy the time with sixth graders. A couple of things real quick before we get into our main topic, because I know you're going to want to talk about being mad. Let's see what we can do. First of all, Buzzsprout. I, I can't keep talking about them enough. I don't care. It, if what kind of podcast you're thinking about starting. And again, I'm not getting paid for this. I just like them that much. Consider Buzzsprout. They have a weekly podcast called Buzzcast. And after I listen to it this week, I guess it's actually monthly Buzzcast. They have another one that is weekly called five minute specials or something to that effect. But anyway, I would encourage you, if you're thinking about starting a podcast, do it. There's all kinds of them out there. Now, my podcast is very much a niche, but there's lots of TV, lots of movie podcasts. If you add a have something special you can add and you promote it, you can always be in good shape with your podcast. But here's what I found out this week. just They, they did an analysis of their customers. They've literally got over 100,000 podcast in their website buzzsprout.com and what they told me this week they gave out the numbers that if you get this many listens in the first 90 days you're at this percentage of how popular your podcast is it started out with 25 percent, which means basically if you're at 25 percent, 75 percent of the podcasts that they publish are more popular than yours. And then it went up to 50. And then it went up to 75. And then it went up to 90. 90 percent, which means only 10 percent of their podcasts get more listeners. And that's where Substitute Teachers Lounge fell. I was I was so shocked and excited about that. I want you to be excited about it. I want us to reach out even more. And to be honest, I'll probably have to gain about 50% listeners to go to that next level, 95%. I would love for you to help me to do that. Now, I hear there are two main ways. The two best ways to make your podcast grow is to be interviewed on somebody else's podcast and they return the favor. I've got that set up to happen in March. March 22nd's episode is going to be that way. If you go back to some of the episodes, you'll even know what podcast it's going to be on. I'll leave you in suspense for now, and we'll talk about that in about a month. Also, by far, probably the way people find Substitute Teachers Lounge most easily is the more of you that give me a five-star rating on Apple Podcast the more that people will find the podcast. Please do that. I know, like I said last week, that 75% of you are actual subscribers. So please go into your Apple Podcast library, scroll down to Substitute Teachers Lounge, and look at that rating. You can also uh, write a review. I'd love to read your review on the air on the next podcast. So do that for me, if you don't mind. Do that for us, and we'll go from there. Now, I mentioned last week, 
I have set up a Patreon account. And to be honest, the main reason is that I am putting off to the last resort of reading live advertisements, even if it's something that I think it would help a substitute teacher out. I want to say that as a last resort. So I have set up a Patreon account. It is live. There is three levels of participation. It's easy enough to get to. All you've got to do is go to patreon.com. That is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. P-A-T-R-E-O-N. So it's patreon.com slash substitute teachers lounge. So easy enough to do that. Now, with that in mind, I prepared an opening video for new members on the Patreon site. I'm going to play the audio of that for you on this podcast right now. So this will be what you will hear, even if you don't sign up. And again, if you don't want to sign up, that's fine. Life will go on as normal. Every Sunday morning, I'll release a new episode of the podcast. If you want to sign up, that's great. If you want to stop after a while, that's great. It'll just help me to keep up with equipment and those kind of things. So as we try to make the podcast better. So let's listen to that audio right now that you'll hear and watch. You'll see a little bit of, you'll actually be forced to see my face. I hate to do that to you, but let's listen to it right now. All right, guys, this is where all the action happens. This is the studio for Substitute Teachers Lounge podcast. And that's a little sarcastic because basically it's just a room upstairs at my house that I use to record the podcast. I am so excited that you've chosen to be a Patreon member of the podcast. That will help so much. At Tier 1, you'll get early access to the normal weekly episode. At Tier 2, we'll add some special episodes that will be posted from time to time. Maybe it'll be subjects that I don't think it's best to talk about on our weekly podcast, but we'll talk about it like separation of church and state and how that affects our schools. We'll talk about different things like is it okay to be considered uh, the student's favorite substitute? If they say that to you, is that okay or should you feel guilty about it? But we'll talk about things like that and then the upper tier will also add in special videos for the for the podcast and things that I've seen that I think you all would really enjoy. But bottom line is I am so happy that you you're a Patreon member. I am going to try my best to make it worth your while. And by all means, email me at gregcollinssubstitute at gmail.com. If you have some things that you'd like to see on here, and we'll make sure we get it done. But I'll see you next time on the podcast. All right, so there you have it. I hope you can help us out at patreon.com slash substitute teachers lounge. If you can't, that is okay, too. We'll get into our topic here in just a moment. I want to mention that upcoming, we have some other interviews that we're trying to get set up, including maybe our first international interview. So hopefully we can get that set up soon and we can move from that. All right, let's talk about now you're already you're thinking, all right, is this just a sarcastic comment that Greg has told us about being mad and then he's just going to say we should never be mad and go from there? Well, maybe a little bit, but I do want to remind you as positive as I try to come across on this podcast and in the classroom and in general, I wasn't always that way. I remember back when my sons, who are now 30, I remember back when they were playing like youth sports at the YMCA leagues back when they were six. I remember one game that I had where the other team, we were like one point down. The other team was lined up to hit a free throw. There was a minute and a half, or I'm sorry, a second and a half left. And there was just some young kids keeping the clock. And as always, in fact, my, my young kids have done that from time to time. And I remember that the, the other opposing coach had chosen to take off his players off the line. So it was just us waiting for a rebound. So it was almost like we had no prayer of getting it all the way up to the other end of the court as six year olds and getting a shot off. If he missed his free throw, well, he missed it. And then my players forgot to go get it. 
and it just bounced and bounced and bounced until it finally rolled out of bounds. Well, technically, you know I'm a rules guy. The clock is not supposed to start until it touches a hand off of the goal, and it didn't, but the young man at the clock started it anyway. So, what did I do? I got mad and jumped up close to the clock and can't believe, you know, that you did that and all this kind of stuff. So I was embarrassed about it later. I apologized to him and his sons or and his dad. So those are the kind of incidences in your life that you try to forget about. I've talked to some guys that I remember coaching against that we've gotten older and more mature and better behaved and just better lives in general. We realize how stupid was that? So I'm glad I grew from that. I'm glad I've turned into the person I am. We all have our faults. We still have our faults, and we try to grow from that. So I don't want you to think I don't have any mad experience. I will tell you this, my favorite phrase, and feel free to make me an idiot because I have no idea where this phrase came from. It may be one of the most popular lines from one of the most popular movies, and feel free to tell me that if you would like. But one of my favorite phrases is, nobody ever makes us mad. We choose sometimes to be mad. I really like that. It's all in the attitude. It's all things that we let get under our skin. Now, the real crux of this episode today will be, when we are concerned, how should we, should we, And how should we follow up? And how should we react when we see the response? If we know something that we would like to share with others, that we have concerns we would like to share with others. Now, let me get to some small ones first that I've noticed. Some of these are ridiculous reasons to be mad. I've touched on this first one a little bit before, the planning period. All of us love that planning period. I think I've told you that my first week of substitute teaching, as much as, you know, as long as my wife had been a substitute teacher, I didn't think about them having a planning period. Obviously, the regular teachers do need a planning period. That's how they grade, that's how they plan their class. In fact, they don't have near enough time to do that. They have to work at home too and work and stay over at school and all that kind of thing. So, the planning period. I remember the first week thinking that I can't believe I get a planning period. I mean, what am I going to do at this hour? I decided to read. I like to read. Now, let's move three months into the future. And occasionally I'll go to a school where the substitutes are really short that day. And my planning period gets taken away. It gets taken away because they're so short, they're having various substitutes do their planning period in a certain class so that one class might have, you know, four different substitutes as the day progresses. And I think it's so funny. There's part of you that thinks at first, you know, should I get mad about this? This is supposed to be my planning period. But then, you know, we're all there to help out. So, It's funny how we get conditioned to expect something, and then when we don't get it, the first thing we we do is maybe get mad about it, maybe get disappointed about it, but I've learned not to get be disappointed. I, you know, it gives us an opportunity to see some more kids, and this particular week, I know one teacher had to leave early. I had to do that, and I was glad to do that, and I had really had some good conversations with those students, so that part of it worked out well. I also mentioned, now this isn't any time I've ever gotten mad, but sometimes we'll be in classes and we see what we got to get covered and we know it's probably going to take them the whole, t- the students the whole time to get in there. And then we often have helpers in the class, parateachers, counselors, various different teachers in capacity. And I love each and every one of them that I've ever met. I consider them friends. We have friendly conversations. I've eaten lunch with them. Sometimes, you know, it makes me a little bit nervous, though, because I know there's something that I want to get through, and the, te- the, the teachers that are in there with me also do a good job of explaining, but sometimes, you know, maybe they'll be in a situation where they're explaining something given their experiences, and my reaction might be the wrong thing. It's, you know, I love your story. How am I going to get through all this, though? But then I check myself. I realize I'm reacting in the wrong way, and 
I'm glad that they are in that class. Uh, the class would not be as good without them. So let's remember that when we have helpers in there with us as a substitute teacher, that they are there to make the class go by better. They're make, there to make the students understand things. If you don't get through the rest of your curriculum for the day, that's okay. We'll get through this. It is definitely nothing to get upset or be bothered about. So that's one other thing that popped to mind. One thing that, you know, I, school systems, school administrators, bless their hearts. We've got such a situation with electronics now that they have to control that I don't blame them for putting limits on them in the classroom. Put the iPhones up, put all the smartphones up, put up your Fitbits, put up your Apple Watches, put up everything so that you're not distracted. A lot of the, most of the middle schools do this. Even some of the high schools, I've noticed over the last couple of years, they used to have it's an okay policy and now they forbid them. But really what I've seen, it, it give, you know, the teachers may still give the students some latitude in that re respect, but I almost think that it's something that it's very hard for substitute teachers to police while they're in the room. It doesn't make me mad, but it's it definitely adds a new level of challenge. I wish we could figure out some way to better incorporate these smartphones and our various gadgets into the classroom itself so that they and, and some of this is already happening. It happened in some classes I had this week where they could actually look up their assignment on their iPhone and read it from there if they'd like, rather than go, going to a Google Chromebook. So I like that. But I would love it if there was a way that administrators could figure out, okay, it's just too hard to police having not having smartphones in the room. So how can we incorporate that into the classrooms? I really think that would give me a less stressful environment to work in. One small thing I'll mention, I noticed this week, now I'm all about, I just mentioned the gadgets, and I'm all about the students using Chromebooks and that type of thing. You know I am a very interactive person. I just love adding some humor, adding some personal stories to the class. Now, I had one class. In fact, I think every class, every school maybe this week use their Chromebooks. Now, I've noticed it's just like people walking around America now with their head down, looking at their iPhones, reading their text messages. It's like we've lost the ability to talk. Now, I do that too, and I'm usually one that's all about gadgets, and I love the gadgets. I just hope that we don't get too far away from conversation. And the reason I bring this up, I noticed in the classroom this week, you know how interactive I like to be. Just notice when we're using the Chromebooks for the whole classroom, to obviously it takes away some of that interactivity. Now, I'll tell you, this is a fact. I hadn't been to a school for a while. I was there this week. I knew several of the students. We had a really good time. They thanked me for being there. They were on Chromebooks. And it's kind of funny, since I hadn't seen them for a while, I shared a lot of my stories. I probably got them behind. And I finally said, man, I've got to shut up and let you guys finish your work. And they say, Mr. Collins, we'll get it done. We want to hear some more of your stories from your experience. And that's so refreshing refreshing to hear that. I'm glad they told me that. I'm still going to act, interact with these children. But that's another thing. We have to figure out a way to deal with gadgets without being upset. We have to have feel a way to continue to be interactive. The more interactivity, to be honest, uh, the more time we have to be interactive if it's extra time in the classroom sometimes that can be kind of stressful so if, because if they've gotten all the way through their assignment and they've got 20 minutes left and you're trying to come up with something to do well that sometimes makes it stressful too but i'm a big interactivity guy hopefully as we can still do, do that even as computer dependent as we are in the classroom so let's work on that in the future too and rather than go back and do a lengthy process on editing. I do want to add one more comment about helpers in the room that I forgot to mention and I just saw in my notes. I wanted to mention, remember that not all the helpers in your room are going to be your personality. You know my personality by now. I like to talk all the time and I 
don't like to yell. Not everybody's like that. So just because another helper doesn't share your personality, to be honest, most of mine do. Most of mine enjoy being active and joking around with the kids in class. Not all of them do. Uh, some of them I don't do as uh, know as well. In fact, some of them, maybe they would be less of a yeller if they knew me better and knew I could control the class, maybe they would be better on that. So, but be to- be tolerant of them. Make sure that you let as much of your personality to show and make sure you let their personality show. I can guarantee you that they are in that classroom for a reason. They are teaching those kids and I love to have each and every one of them. Now we'll jump ahead a little bit to maybe something a little more intense And maybe what you thought about when I first said this, I will never sit here and say that I am as important as a teacher. I'm not. I'm a substitute teacher. I'm not credentialed. I'm just somebody that loves working and and teaching and discussing things with those kids. I don't have to discuss with parents unless maybe I'm a long-term for a little while. I don't have to worry about grading tests unless I'm a long-term substitute. There's a lot of things that I don't have to go to administrative meetings. There is no way I can say that I am as important as a teacher. I have a different role. Now, at that point, we as substitute teachers, the more we substitute teach, the more we see things and we think of ideas that we'd like to share. Now, how do we share those ideas? I think I have learned in my process of trying to share ideas over the months, probably the 18 months that I've substitute taught, I want to share ideas. I haven't always gone about it the right way. Some of the ones that I have shared, they've said, that sounds great. Let's take that forward and see what we can do with it. The others, I didn't do a good job of sharing. You know, perception is a big thing. I sometimes perceive something that I hear from students. That is their perception. Even if a school system maybe has something set up and They think it's going to be great, and it's usually always great, but sometimes we as adults don't always perceive things in the way that students do. And when they share that with me, I try to take it forward, but let's go to the flip side. Maybe I don't share it properly. Maybe I might have entered in with good intentions, but didn't realize what the perception of the adults would be when I shared that. So... I've got to really be conscious about that. I've got to really work on being diplomatic. All of us do. Let's try to get to know our fellow coworkers, whether that be teacher, substitute teacher, whatever, so that we can share ideas and concerns with them without offending anyone. That's my goal. I apologize to anyone out there that I have ever made upset or made offended or concerned because of the way I might me share an idea, which I totally think is as diplomatic as I can be until I realize how it sounded on the other end. And just as kids have perceptions of things and I try to talk about it, well, maybe then I talk about things and my perception is or the other's perception is different than what I thought they would be. And I realized that I didn't share that in a way I should. There's really never a reason for us to be be mad, but it's okay to be concerned. It's okay to share our thoughts. Let's just really work hard on sharing them in such a way that all of us as teachers, substitute teachers, administrators can all grow together. So for the most part, summary today's podcast don't get don't ever get mad. Don't let people see you get mad. It's okay though to be concerned and share ideas. Let's just work work with each other and together to make sure we do that in the appropriate fashion. Yelling is not the appropriate fashion. Sticking to your guns regardless of what anybody says, maybe that's not even an appropriate reaction given perceptions of others. So, let's all work to understand ways that we can share things diplomatically and not make it an upsetting thing. One other thing I wanted to mention this week, because as I eat with other teachers when I'm there, especially long term, sometimes we talk about, you know, ways we, you know, sometimes we're trying to get healthy. 
I'm trying something new this week. It's called intermittent fasting. I'm going to guess that a lot of you have heard of that. I basically fast 20 hours a day and then have a four-hour window that I can do my eating in each day. It's working out well so far. All of you teachers and substitutes out there that have experience with this, I would love to interview you. I think it is important for teachers to be healthy and make sure that we're there as much as we can be. So I very much think this is on topic. So Greg Collins, substitute at gmail.com. And I'll close with a very serious comment. In my area, we lost a teacher this week. I will be substituting this week along with several others to help the situation at that school. Guys, I also want to say as substitute teachers, always be prepared to fill in. I don't know what I'm teaching. I thought at one time I might actually be teaching math. I went ahead and contacted another teacher at another school for this age group to get some lesson plan ideas. I also did a little studying on YouTube for the topic. I would say always be prepared to fill in, help out a school whenever they need you to help, and always be willing to go out of your way, share ideas in that respect. Our thoughts and prayers go out to that family, and I just want to close with those thoughts. We will see you next week on Substitute Teacher's Lounge. Music provided by Ben Sound.